maximum speed that these things can reach is something like 1100 kilometers per hour. Um, so, uh, so the idea is to connect up these two big cities, Mumbai and Pune. These are two of India's largest, and Mumbai is India's largest city. Pune, I think, is the eighth largest or ninth largest city in India. And uh, and uh, and uh, there are there are I think five or six different hyperloop projects around. If Hyperloop, in fact, becomes a reality, it will happen first in Mumbai. So that's what the paper is about. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, about the about the concepts that we use to think about this problem, and then uh, Tushar will talk about uh, how Mumbai stands to benefit from this uh, kind of technology. So. So, you know, naturally, uh, when we started, when this question first came up, that how is the Hyperloop line going to impact uh, these two big cities, uh, our first um, uh, you know, our first action was to basically think about it uh, from through the lens of urban economics. So there's a very large literature about cities, about the formation of cities, how cities grow, how cities uh, languish, why firms locate where they locate, why households and families locate where they locate. So all of these uh, questions are studied by urban economists. And, uh, and uh, basically, you know, we, we mined the urban economics literature and we discovered that there were roughly about three or four different strands that uh, urban economics uh, offers uh, to study the formation of cities, to study how transport systems impact cities. So um, one of these strands looks at uh, how economies of scale and agglomeration economies are responsible for the, for the formation of cities. So economies of scale are internal to the firm. Uh, they arise whenever a firm has to undertake very high fixed cost. And so economies of scale arise when that fixed cost can be spread over a large number of units. Um, agglomeration economies have to do with uh, firms locating firms co-locating uh, in, in the same area, uh, has to do with firms and households co-locating in the same area. Um, uh, economists have studied these kinds of agglomerations and they uh, largely conclude that, uh, that agglomeration economies drive spatial concentration of firms and households for various reasons. Uh, firms may want to co-locate uh, near to their suppliers, firms may want to co-locate near households, and then there's also um, uh, a lot of knowledge transfer that happens through labor flows uh, in between firms that co-locate near to each other. So uh, there are models that show how these kinds of economies, both, in, uh, both economies that are both internal to the firm and external to the firm, agglomeration economies are external to the firm, how these kinds of economies give rise of cities. Um, uh, some of these, uh, the, the, there's a second strand uh, in the urban economics literature which studies, uh, uh, which models cities as urban spatial structures that are monocentric in nature. So there is a central business district in these models and, uh, and these kinds of models generate predictions about uh, population density, about housing supply, housing demand, and such things. And then you take uh, these models and you can create dynamic stories or dynamic, by dynamic narratives about how cities grow. So how, for instance, a monocentric city with a central business district will begin to feed some of the economic life and economic activity to its fringes, and how suburbanization happens as uh, populations increase, incomes increase, and transport costs fall. So uh, there's a whole bunch of models that describe uh, cities from that perspective, city formation from that perspective. And uh, these are also the kinds of models that economists use to study how cities sometimes languish and fall apart. Uh, for instance, if economic activity moves away from a city, uh, as has happened in some American cities in the last couple of decades, how cities can sometimes 
And then there is a third class of uh, models that largely have to do with uh, arbitrage mechanisms, uh, where uh, the, the, the modeling um, approach is one of a rational actor uh, setup, where uh, a rational actor has to choose where to locate between two locations which have fundamentally different characteristics. And so these are equilibrium models which show that uh, in equilibrium, a rational actor will sometimes trade off the characteristics of one location against the characteristics of another location. And so in these kinds of models, you can sometimes get, uh, you can explain, for instance, the coexistence of, uh, of uh, uh, very prosperous cities uh, alongside uh, cities that are not so prosperous. Uh, why? Because the rational actor model would predict that a rational actor would trade off some of the benefits of living in the uh, in the prosperous city, uh, the primary benefit being higher incomes, against uh, the benefits of living in the less prosperous city where the primary benefit would be low housing costs. So these kinds of models basically uh, then uh, try to explain how cities grow uh, by looking explicitly at differences across cities. And these differences could be productivity differences, they could be differences in amenities available in these cities, they could be differences in the nature of the construction sector. So, uh, for instance, some cities might grow not because of agglomeration economies and not because of uh, differential amenities, but because perhaps the, uh, the housing supply or the scope for urban development is greater in one city rather than another. So uh, these kinds of models, mostly coming from urban economics, they tend to do a fairly good job of explaining uh, the dynamics of, uh, of uh, the evolution of cities in, uh, in much of the advanced industrialized world. Um, in the developing world, however, and especially in a country like India, uh, most cities in India are uh, have uh, have uh, formed and grown in a in a rather haphazard way, and uh, this is nowhere truer than in the case of Mumbai. Uh, and uh, and so these models don't really give you a a good handle on what is happening in cities like Mumbai. In fact, uh, urban economists have written about how most Indian cities are not monocentric. Mumbai certainly is a polycentric city. There are several different business districts, not just a single central business district. So that diagram on top shows you the different kinds of uh, uh, models that uh, that city formation can can take. That's the classic monocentric model. Then you have the polycentric model. You can have composites, etc. So we look at uh, the urban economics literature primarily to think about this problem. How are we going to assess the economic impact of a hyperloop line between uh, Mumbai and Pune, and uh, and uh, and we discover that uh, that urban economics, at least, does not seem to give us uh, enough conceptual resources to think about this problem. Any urban economists here? Okay, um, so we see that urban economics, for instance, does not give us enough conceptual resources to think about this problem. And the reason is uh, primarily the significant reduction in travel time that is made possible <coughs> by Hyperloop. So Hyperloop, so this is a map of India and that uh, the, the, the blue lines basically show uh, connections between some of the biggest cities in India. Uh, so Mumbai is... Uh, Mumbai is right around there. Uh, that's Pune. Uh, down here is a city called Bangalore. So this shows you some of uh, the, uh, 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 the blue line is connecting up some of the biggest metro areas in India. And, uh, and those times are the projected times uh, of, of, uh, of travel uh, along a hyperloop network between these cities. Uh, this is probably high speed rail and not high, uh, no, this is hyperloop, yes. So uh, if you connected up Mumbai to Pune, so that's, 
that's this distance here, that distance there. That distance nowadays takes about three and a half hours by car to traverse. A hyperloop line would reduce that travel time to just 30 minutes. So that's a significant reduction in travel time. And we discovered that urban economics models don't really give us a way to think about uh, what this reduction in travel time will do. And the reason for that is that conventional models in urban economics do not really model travel time explicitly. So if you think about the spatial arbitrage model, uh, in these models, arbitrage does not actually ever happen. Arbitrage always already has happened. So arbitrage is never modeled explicitly. Uh, so presumably, if you took a model like this, you could explain, for instance, the differences between, say, New York and Chicago, which are quite far apart, and the differences between New York and Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, which are quite close to each other. Uh, you could use the same set of factors to explain the differences between these two different pairs of cities. But let's say you have a hyperloop line that now connects New York to Chicago and brings Chicago, therefore, much closer to New York than Philadelphia is to New York. Uh, you can't really use urban economics models to study uh, how, uh, how the New York-Chicago uh, difference will look like uh, once you introduce a technology like that. And that is because the actual time of commuting between New York and Chicago, or between New York and Philadelphia does not enter these models, okay? Commuting time is a vanishing variable in models of spatial arbitrage. So essentially, this is equivalent to saying that time is virtual in these models. Time is not real in these models. Um, so, so we actually uh, propose this uh, concept called the cost of distance arbitrage in order to think about uh, what impact a hyperloop network will have on the urban geographies of Mumbai and Chennai. And what this is, is it's just arbitrage and uh, the quantum of arbitrage or the force or the intensity of the force of arbitrage will depend on the cost of distance. So if the cost of distance is significantly reduced, then the force of arbitrage will be quite intense. So arbitrage is actually axiomatically about distance. So if you look at, for instance, models of international trade, uh, arbitrage happens when, uh, when the distance cost of transporting goods from one location to another significantly is reduced. Or if you look at arbitrage in financial markets across two different geographical locations, uh, the force of arbitrage is strong and intense if there are very few restrictions or impediments to the flow of capital, which is essentially something like a distance variable. So we we say that you know what what the hyperloop line is. Yes. Sorry, just a clarification. Is there a capacity constraint on hyperloop? Uh, yes. We have to talk. To, I I don't know, but it's not like everybody can instantly move to Chicago, right? Yeah. Selected numbers of people will be able to move. Yeah. And presumably those are the people who can afford it. Yeah. Yeah. So we talk. I I'll, I'll give you some sense of what those numbers might be for Mumbai and Pune. Yeah, very much so, and that's one of the actually critics criticisms of Hyperloop, that uh, it's going to move much fewer people per hour than, say, high-speed rail or air traffic. Um, Yeah, so we are trying to uh, talk about arbitrage happening in real time. You want to understand how this arbitrage? What's exactly. The what what are the what are the contours of this mecha mechanism of arbitrage, and what are the different uh, concrete examples, for instance, or concrete manifestations that this course of arbitrage will take, which is something that is missing in standard models of spatial arbitrage. Because they are always the, the co commuting cost is a vanishing variable in those models. Um, 
So actually, I'm just trying to distinguish or differentiate this concept from the concept of arbitrage that is present in these spatial arbitrage models. Um, so what we are arguing basically is that what this technology is going to do is it's going to arbitrage the differences between Munda and Pune Mali, both quantitative differences and qualitative differences. So we're going to talk about what, I'm going to give you two specific examples of how that might work. Uh, but, you know, that's Mumbai, and that's central Mumbai. This is a, a hub called the Bandra Kula complex, or BKC. Um, this is an airport just outside Mumbai that is coming up now. It's called the Navi Mumbai International Airport, and that's Pune. And so this is about a 150, 160 kilometer, 120, okay, 120, one, uh, around that much kilometer uh, distance. And this takes about three and a half hours by car right now. And uh, with the Hyperloop, this is going to take uh, about 25 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, now, Mumbai and Pune are two of the biggest cities in India. This is in the state of Maharashtra in India. Uh, Maharashtra is one of the most prosperous states in India. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Indian economy, India is about a $2.6 trillion um, GDP economy. This is as at market exchange rates. And uh, so uh, GDP per capita is roughly around 2,000 US dollars per capita. Uh, Maharashtra state uh, is responsible for about $390 billion of that $2.6 trillion number. So that's a big contribution that the, that the state of Maharashtra makes to Indian GDP. Um, Maharashtra is the third most urbanized state in India, 45% urbanization rate. Uh, Mumbai is, of course, the financial capital of India, and it is the largest city in India. Uh, about 12 million people, if you just look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the city area, if you include the metro, the larger metro, uh, metropolitan area of Mumbai, that includes up to about 90 to 20. Million people. Um, Mumbai is, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a sixth. Uh, it, it has the sixth highest number of billionaires in the world. Something like forty-eight, uh, no, something like twenty-eight billionaires. About forty-three thousand millionaires. So it's a it's a it's a rich city. Uh, yet at the same time. Uh, more than 60% of the city lives in slums. So there's a lot of disparity in Mumbai. Um, most of the uh, economy of Mumbai is financial services, uh, jewelry, uh, textiles, IT and IT services, and uh, leather processing. Uh, Mumbai contributes about, uh, employs about 10% of India's factory um, labor. Uh, accounts for about 25% of India's industrial output, uh, about 33% of income taxes paid in India come from Mumbai, and about 40% of India's foreign trade Mumbai is responsible for. So it's a big, massive contributor to uh, the Indian economy. Uh, out of the $390 billion of GDP that Maharashtra produces, almost $300 billion just comes from Mumbai by some estimates. Um, Pune is uh, India's, I think, ninth largest city, uh, eighth largest metro economy, uh, a population of about four to five million. Uh, if you include uh, the larger Pune metropolitan area, it's about eight or nine, eight million people. Um, Pune is a much more homogeneous city in terms of its economy, so most of Pune's economy is concentrated in three areas, manufacturing, and that too mostly auto, um, IT and IT services, and education. So Pune is often called the Oxford of the East because it's an, it's an educational hub, a lot of educational institutions are located in Pune. Um, so these are the kinds of uh, cities that the Hyperloop Line is hoping to connect. So Mumbai and Pune together represent about 23 million plus residents. Now, what we are saying is that what you're going to get as a result of this Hyperloop line connecting Mumbai to Pune is we are calling it a mega 
Megalopolis. Uh, so you're going to have practically a single city area uh, having, a, you know, if you just add up the population, something like any, anywhere between 23 and 26 million residents. Um, a Hyperloop line will probably look similar to the one that is shown here. Uh, by the way, these images are from Virgin Hyperloop One's website. We are not representing Virgin Hyperloop One. We've just taken these images from their website. Um, but this is the, the the Hyperloop line that is envisioned is probably going to look something like this. So it's going to connect the something like the Bandra Kurla complex, which is a major transport hub inside Mumbai. Um, to uh, the center of Pune, uh, place called Shivaji Nagar in Pune, and uh, you're probably going to have a connection to the Navi Mumbai International Airport. Uh, there is Mumbai does have another airport in the city, so uh, that's very close to the BKC complex. Uh, most likely, the Hyperloop line will not connect that airport to BKC. Uh, there is a metro line that is being planned that will connect that airport to this airport. Uh, but if the Hyperloop line were to connect these two airports, meaning the one that already exists and the one that is being built, that would be practically like a single airport because it would take you about 10 minutes to go from one airport to another. So these are called, uh, there, there's this idea that Hyperloop economists uh, like to talk about, which is called mega airports, where you have airports which are about 40, 70 kilometers apart practically functioning like a single airport. So one airport is just like one terminal of the other airport. Um, so obviously, you know, there are scale economies in, uh, in merging two distinct airports into a single airport. And one of the economic implications of a Hyperloop line would be precisely that. Um, there, there, are, there are other possibilities for how the Hyperloop network, what, what the network would actually look like. But in some, what the network would probably involve is a mixture of airports and major transit hubs. Uh, so we, we argue that cost of distance arbitrage will be the primary economic force at work. So I say leveling of prices, but really I'm not talking about the levels of prices, but rather the growth rates or the inflation rates. Uh, so what you'll probably see once the Hyperloop network is in place is uh, that real estate prices will begin to inflate in Mumbai at roughly the same rates as they do in Pune. Right now, Mumbai's real estate price inflation is much higher than that in Pune. Uh, uh, large swathes of distance between the two cities will begin to uh, come under development. And most of this development is likely, if there is no change in the in the, in, the, in the regulatory environment, then most of this uh, 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 development is likely to happen more at the Pune end of things than Mumbai. And the reason for that is simple, Mumbai is waterlogged. So Mumbai is unable to grow except vertically. And Mumbai has been prevented from growing vertically by uh, what is called the FSI, the floor space index regime in Mumbai. So FSI basically is a number that describes how high you can build on a piece of land. And Mumbai's FSI numbers, so Mumbai is, you know, uh, is a waterlogged city. Most waterlogged cities in the world uh, that are important financial centers of finance are also skyscraper cities. Hong Kong being an example, New York. Uh, Mumbai is a waterlogged city, but it's not a skyscraper city. I mean, if you are, if you, if you fly into Mumbai and you are driving from the airport into the city, you will see some skyscrapers. But uh, there are far fewer skyscrapers than there should be. And the reason for that is that, uh, that uh, 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 builders are prevented from building tall buildings in Mumbai because of uh, these FSI restrictions. And these FSI numbers were decided in 1964 and they still have not been revised, even as the city has uh, grown substantially. Uh, so therefore, much of the development uh, that will happen, much of the economic and real estate development that will happen will most likely happen at the Pune end of things. Um, but you're going to see two different uh, effects. Uh, one is called the tunnel effect. So typically when you have a transport 
system connecting two points, you have you see a lot of realistic development at the nodes of that system, and not enough development on a, uh, in the intranodal area, and that is because uh, because there are there are, there are no exit points out of that network along the along the uh, the, 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 the space between the two nodes. Uh, so something like a hyperloop network is going to intensify the tunnel effect, which means that if you're going to have uh, hyperloop connecting, say, the Bandra Kula complex in Mumbai to Shivajinagar and Pune, most of the real estate development is going to happen at these nodes and not enough in between. But uh, if, uh, but that also, uh, uh, you know, if, if you add on the fact that uh, Mumbai has restricted FSI numbers, then you're also going to see a lot of suburbanization happening, which is that you're going to see a lot of uh, new real estate development happening at the fringes of Mumbai, because that's the only way Mumbai can really grow. Yes? So going back to this, when you talk about there being a real estate crisis and so on, so the number of commuters is very important, right? Yes, yes. 500 people are commuting and this cannot happen. Yeah. Yeah, we, I'll give you a sense of the numbers. Okay. I mean, see, uh, so one of the things that I did not say earlier, which I should have said, is that the kind of analysis we are doing, so we don't have a mathematical model here. Uh, so this is, we are taking a more urban planning approach uh, in figuring out what the economic impact of this kind of uh, technology will be. And, uh, and so what urban planners will usually do is they will not only think about economic growth, they will also think about other objectives, say like social equity, or uh, environmental sustainability, or even aesthetic appeal, for that matter. So, uh, somebody like uh, you know David Harvey, who is an urban geographer, uh, if you look at his work, he basically thinks about city formation not just through the lens of economic growth, or not just through the lens of of an economic model like urban economists would. But uh, he also thinks about cities through the lens of, uh, say, the legal, institutional, and administrative frameworks by which the city is governing itself, or maybe by the uh, the uh, you know the relations between different classes of residents in the city, so social relations, or the relations between city residents and nature, for that matter, or even the normative ideals that those residents have about. You know, mental conceptions of the world. So that is the kind of approach we are taking. So we, are, we have this concept called cost of distance arbitrage, which kind of anchors the paper in an economic force that we believe is going to get activated when the Hyperloop network comes into uh, place. But we also think about how this economic force interacts with the existing, say, regulatory, infrastructural, and geophysical constraints of the two cities. And here, Mumbai is is a city that is constrained on all of those fronts in a way that Pune is not. So if you look at the combined area of the, uh, that is under the jurisdiction of PMRD, the Pune Metropolitan Regional Development Authority, it's an area of about 3,500 square kilometers, second largest in India. Whereas Mumbai doesn't have that. You know, Mumbai doesn't have land that it can develop really. The only way Mumbai can grow is up. Just curious, what is the current price difference between real estate prices in these two cities? So I know that the cost of living in in uh, in Pune is about thirty percent less than that in Mumbai. I don't know the extent for the real estate component of that difference, um, but real estate prices are inflating at much higher rates in Mumbai than in Pune, and that's again because real estate supply in in Mumbai is artificially restricted by these very low FSI numbers, in a way that they're not restricted in Pune. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be done soon. Uh, so two concrete examples of arbitrage. One is this idea that real estate prices are going to start inflating at the same rates. There was a, a report by Knight Frank, which is a real estate consulting company. It's a British consulting company. They have offices in Mumbai. They published a report in 2017 uh, they published a report in 2018 about real estate prices in 2017, and they showed that in Pune, both residential and commercial property prices were inflating at a much slower rates than in, than in Mumbai. And 
that's because there's excess supply in Pune. So one uh, obvious kind of arbitrage that will happen is that more and more people will choose to live in Pune and perhaps work in Mumbai. Um, and that's going to bring these inflation rates, that's going to cause these inflation rates to converge. But there are also qualitative, there's a qualitative sense in which uh, these two cities are going to start looking similar to one another. So right now, uh, Mumbai is a is a favored lo favored location for so-called co-working spaces. What are co-working spaces? Basically, you uh, you locate different parts of the company in different geographical locations. So you don't necessarily want to locate strategy and marketing and finance and operations, maybe an HR in the same place. You can split it up and locate it in different locations. That is a trend that is beginning to spread worldwide, and there are several startup companies that are beginning to invest in Mumbai in a big way because. As a, as a hub for these kinds of spaces to develop. And what you need for uh, uh, co-working to be successful is you need a heterogeneous labor force, so there are many different kinds of labor. Uh, and you need, uh, you need scale because uh, to invest in co-working spaces is lumpy. So we are arguing that another respect in which this force of arbitrage might manifest is that it shifts this focus away from Mumbai towards Pune. Pune right now has a more homogeneous labor force. Most of it is IT and manufacturing, like I said. Uh, so therefore, right now it's not so feas it's not economically uh, attractive uh, for co-working uh, startups to locate or to invest in Pune. But that's going to change once uh, the hybrid network comes into play. So, uh, and here's the question: the uh, a sense of the numbers. So if you have a, and this is uh, optimistic. Uh, but uh, let's say you have a 50 passenger port capacity. Uh, so if you do some, if you if you make some assumptions, one port every 20 seconds, operational cycle of 10 hours, you're talking 100,000 passengers per day. Okay, and you can increase that number if you uh, have multiple tubes, not just a single tube. So if you have a single tube, that's about how much you will be able to transport. Uh, but if you have multiple tubes, so if you have three, for instance, two-way hyperloop tubes you're talking 600,000 passengers per day. Now if you actually look at the traffic between Mumbai and Pune today, uh, uh, that's about 200,000 passengers every day between Mumbai and Pune. So, so this, this kind of uh, technology has the capacity to fully account for the kind of traffic that Mumbai and Pune already experience on a daily basis. You can co construct multiple scenarios Whatever the scenario, it appears that so from everything I've just said, Pune seems to benefit disproportionately relative to Mumbai. So one of the things that I'm going to hand it over to Tushar now, one of the things he's going to talk about is what's in it for Mumbai. Yes. Are these numbers given by the hyperloop page? No. So these are, I mean, they have their own numbers. Okay. Uh, they are, these are, so they are saying it's, uh, they are tapping the port capacity at 25. Assume 50 passengers. And what passengers. about the bus frequency? Yeah, that I think I'm going to answer yeah, these questions. Yeah. All right, so these are our assumptions indeed. Um, however, the system is ever evolving. And, you know, there are multiple companies taking a stab at what the port capacity should be. And we must also understand that the system is pretty dynamic in the sense that uh, it's not merely the way it functions in rail, where particular bogey would have a capacity and a timetable, right? It's a dynamic system, so it's on demand, and the pods themselves can be coupled electrically, right? So it's, it's each pod can actually wait for five other pods, and they can move every 20 seconds. Effectively, this number, even if it's, let's say, 15 passengers per pod, there can be six such pods waiting at a portal, which is what you know, the company calls a station, right? You, you effectively have 300 people moving out every 20 seconds. So the coupling itself is dynamic uh, because the, the entire system is, you know, uh, based uh, on a proprietary system that allows for such arrangements of pods, and these numbers are therefore flexible. They don't, you know, they change completely depending on your assumptions. I want to challenge that assumption. I don't see how you can get fifty people into, you know, fifty seats in twenty seconds. Yeah. And once they are seated, you can move it out. But yeah. how do you get the next one filled? Yeah. Okay, good question. So that's actually one of the questions that you know uh, highlights the fact that we don't really understand how this technology will play out, but there are answers to that. 
So the way the portals are designed, and I can't show you those images of course, um, is that you would already have people waiting, right, at the particular portals. You would have pods waiting any which way. So you just like you book an Uber and you reach the main gate, and the Uber is there just about the same time as you would reach there. Similarly, people would arrive in the same way at the portals, right? Um, wait there for a particular time. And the, the pods may not necessarily leave just as when you arrive, all right? You may have to wait for, let's say, a minute or 30 seconds or whatever, whatever the buffer time may be. Uh, depending on the number of pods you want to couple yourself with, okay? And the, the, the average math turns out to be that you can couple it with as many as six pods, okay? So if you have 50 passenger pods, you can couple it you know, with, with frequencies of around 30 seconds or 20 seconds, depending on what the simulations are, all right? Um, but the point of the whole argument is that these numbers are very much flexible, right? Uh, even if the pod themselves, or the, the pods themselves be designed for 25 passengers, you have roughly around anywhere between 150 to 300 leaving every 30 seconds, and you have you know, operational cycles also that are completely demand driven, right? So it's not that they would only be operating for 10 hours during the day. They would virtually be open 24 hours, right? Um, and effectively you overshoot these numbers. So I would actually say that we were not being optimistic with these numbers, we were actually being, you know, middle order. Uh, not too optimistic, not too pessimistic with these, okay? But moving on, um, I would actually talk about how Mumbai benefits, right? So a lot, a last part of the presentation till now was about how Pune is cheap and you know there's a cheaper you know cost of living. Also to answer the real estate uh, question. So as he asked, you know the, the cost of real estate in Mumbai and the cost of real estate in Pune, the differences between the two. Now let's understand something. Uh, Mumbai itself is not homogeneous as any other city would would not be as well, right? But in the case of Mumbai you also have massive price differences in real estate. So the, the western suburbs of the city are completely differently priced compared to what the, the island city is. And far out suburbs, the eastern suburbs, and even uh, newer agglomerations that are formed in the northern part of the city are perhaps at around 20 or 30% or even 10% valuations as the island city itself is. So there's no average real estate value of what Mumbai can you know, uh, exhibit today. Because a lot of this is also dependent on how many spare units of real estate um, are available in different parts of the city, right? But Pune in general is around one third if you were to talk about average prices of real estate, you know? So up until now, all we were talking about is that Pune would benefit. You know, a lot many people would go to Pune because of the cheaper prices, because of, um, you know, access to housing, um, access to cheaper cost of living and so on. But this is where Mumbai benefits, right? And this is what I'm going to talk about right now. So Mumbai has suffered because of the FSI regime. That has been established in the first part of the presentation, right? Um, I'll be talking about this in combination with this map right here. So this is a bit outdated, but uh, you know, a large part of this is still relevant, right? This is from a paper by uh, uh, Alan Berto um, from 2011. And if you see the FSI right here, the, the regime is quite draconian, right? You have the 0.75 numbers in the eastern part of the city. You have 1.33 right here um, in the island city. And then you have a standard FSI of 1 in the western suburbs and, you know, some part of the eastern suburbs in Pawai and so on. Um, the idea is this severely restricts um, any kind of population influx. Yet, Mumbai sees unprecedented numbers of immigrants each day. Some estimates say 50,000 each day, some say much higher. Right, which is why we have the 60% uh, number around how people just don't get affordable housing right, um, at, at the price they want, which is what leads to more, um, you know, an increase in the number of slums and others are shanties. Now the idea here is simple. If you connect DKC, which ironically along with Nalavi, which is Asia's largest slum, has been given an FSI of 4.0, all right? So if you come to DKC, if anyone of you has visited Mumbai ever, um, you see how a number of office spaces, a number of uh, commercial spaces are really sort of, you know, pretty much similar to certain other business districts in other parts of the world. Maybe not as developed as Hong Kong would be or as Manhattan would be, but at the same time it's, you know, eons apart from the rest of the city, even compared to the island city. Similarly, there is this patch right here in Nahavi, which again has, you know, an FSI of 4.0. Now, these in status quo are the only bastions of you know, real estate development that the city is awarded. But in the case of a Hyperloop line connecting to Pune, right, 
um, it changes the game. And this is where you know models that exist in status quo do not capture that. Could you just put into context what it means to have an SSI around say 0.75? Sure, sure. All right. So uh, okay. So okay. Interesting question. Now an FSI of one right here is nothing but you know you need to own x amount of land to develop x amount of floor space, total floor space area on that land. Effectively, what it means is if you have 10 square feet, or let's say you have 10,000 square meters, you can only develop 10,000 square meters of depth of floor space uh, on that patch of land. Effectively, an FSI of one means if you have a patch of land, it can only be a ground floor building. It can't even go to the first level. And effectively, therefore, you you know uh, you compress uh, the structure, and you know you perhaps only use one patch of the available land, and you build a multi-story structure. This actually shows, as a matter of fact, how draconian this number is. You know, and like 0.75 is just, I mean, there are a lot of salt pans here, and there are other ecologically sensitive areas as well. There's a flamingo sanctuary right about here. Obviously, this open creek area is itself sensitive. But the idea is one is just unheard of in a major city of the kind of economic output that Lucas Roche described earlier. Yeah, just a follow up to that. Is there any reason why it hasn't been changed since 1964, despite the city seeing such tremendous amounts of growth before it's not been changed? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are many reasons for that. But Primarily, if I would sum it up, it's just policy paralysis. And there's also a number of other reasons: the land mafia, the fact that you know, uh, large part of the city itself was a congregation of multiple islands through landfill, um, and therefore the foundations are not really appropriate everywhere. Obviously, also because of existing uh, ownership um, that is not necessarily going to be transferred to the government or to other private developers. Um, but in general, it's policy paralysis. No single regime, no single political regime has pushed for this enough, or even has realized that you know this this is a severe um, you know constraint. But there's also an urban planning lens to that. Um, Sorry, but, uh, you can answer him, but uh, just want to know <laughs> Sure, sure. It looks like you had a lot of time. Sure, I just have three more options. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, to answer that, the, the other aspect is that FSI traditionally by urban planners is controlled based on a number of other variables, such as amenities, sewage, or uh, road. You know, the width of the road is one of the biggest uh, determiner of how tall your building should go. And planners in general in Mumbai have argued that, um, you know, the road width, the average road width in Mumbai just can't take that many number of uh, commuters, so to say. Mumbai also does not have a robust public transport system. It does have the Western Railway Line and the Central Railway, right? But it does not, you know, it does not have a robust public transportation system as, say, a Hong Kong has. And therefore, people culturally, as well as because of the lack of an infrastructure setup, use private vehicles. And therefore, congestion levels have just gone off the roof in the last few years. Um, and again, you know, that, that is the other urban planning angle of why the FSI is not been increased. So this, this overall is a picture of what Mumbai is currently, right? Um, what we suggest is, you know, obviously a lot of suggestions in the absence of the hyperloop is an integrated transportation, um, you know, setup, right? The metros, the railways, and so on. But in our case, um, you know, we, we noticed that if I go back to the hyperloop line, we noticed that suddenly Mumbai is going to be equidistant temporarily, right, in terms of the amount of time you would expend to Pune as opposed to other parts of Mumbai itself. So it takes about you know, half an hour or 45 minutes to reach from here to here right now. Bandra Kula is one of the business districts right now. The central business district that is traditionally defining Mumbai is Nariman Point, which is around here, right? Or here, actually, precisely. It takes about an hour, hour and a half to reach there. But temporarily now, you are actually equidistant to Pune. Um, all you have to do is actually get at the station, which is proposed to be around PKC. And suddenly, you can just, you know, uh, be in another geography, which is, again, something urban economics models don't capture in status quo. So that's one kind of an advantage that you know solves for and builds on the multimodal connectivity aspect that has been proposed by current policymakers, right? But all in all, there are four levers that we can talk about here, and that's where the hand of policy is important, right? About what the government should do, what the regulators should do. Obviously, there is line capacity right there, which Professor Ghosh touched upon briefly. Uh, the FSI restriction, you know, urban planning arguments in status quo, which argue against increasing FSI because of the fact that there would be congestion levels that would beyond bearable levels can suddenly be put to rest because a large number of the you know working population that would work in these business districts, you know, educated individuals who would want to engage in uh, new economy jobs, 
uh, they can actually utilize the hyperloop line and go, you know, you know, live somewhere else or work somewhere else. And therefore, the the idea that you don't have to, you know, live in the same city and be subject to the constraints that this city offers because of the water of nature and the regulatory uh, history behind it is the idea that propels uh, the, the hyperloop argument to begin with, right? So that, and therefore, you can also increase FSI. Um, in, in, in line with you know the metro lines that are coming up within Mumbai, so the multimodal co you know connectivity, which is what this map talks about, right, can actually account for a hyperloop connecting to Pune and can account for intra-city transportation of people um, without overburdening the road system that is currently overburdened. And this can be phased out over five, ten, and fifteen years, which is what we argue in our paper. All right. Of course, fare structure is another aspect. You know, I mean because we've not developed a quantitative model in our paper, um, and also because negotiations of the government um, are premised on the fact that fair structure would be market-driven. We understand that fair structure um, would be you know, another aspect, another lever, so to say, for policy makers to look at when... Um, yeah, when, when, when you actually talk about, uh, when, when you talk about the impact of this line on the, the entire agglomerations development. Okay, um, right. So let's just recap the entire presentation before going to the last slide, which is what this is, right? The status quo is that the cities, Mumbai, Navi Mumbai, and Pune, are operated with, you know, by different developmental authorities, by different municipal corporations, and that is an issue because it's not an issue insofar as the policymaker or the bureaucrat in charge would think of the region as a whole, but that's not what happens currently. Currently, there are two frames of looking at this entire uh, development, right? One frame is the city, uh, the, the lens is at the city level, where you know something like a, an MMRD, which is the Mumbai Metropolitan Region Development Authority, would plan for the city of Mumbai or the MMR, which basically is what you can see right here, right? The Mumbai Metropolitan Region, which originally only was this, okay? And the other is PMRD or the Pune end. There's also CIDCO, which is the City Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, which is uh, for Navi Mumbai elsewhere, all right, here. Uh, so, so the idea is, you know, these individual policy making platforms or the developmental authorities would only maximize their own jurisdiction's development. They would not look at the regional level because the next plane of policy making exists at the Chief Minister's office. And the Chief Minister's office at the government of Maharashtra level would look at the entire state as opposed to, you know, this particular region or they would look at individual districts just as the developmental authorities. And therefore, recommendation is to actually, you know, form a special planning authority or similar such entity, which incorporates different city level uh, departments, different policy making platforms at the state level, as well as, you know, special um, officers from the government of India. This is unprecedented. This does not happen anywhere in the world, as a matter of fact, right? Unless you have an SAR status, like in the case of Hong Kong, or if you have individual, um, you know, autonomous bodies such as Transport for London or others, you don't really have a mandate beyond your city um, to a larger regional um, level. And that basically is one of our recommendations, um, you know. And another one of the recommendations is to perform more frequent, comprehensive transportation surveys. So the MMRD performs this, and it's a decadal exercise. So it happens once in ten years for mobility plans in terms of how commuters move around the city and so on. We propose that the hyperloop completely changes the ball game because, you know, as the first half of the presentation showed, you know, the, the speeds and the, the time differences that are being plugged is unprecedented. And therefore, a once in 10 year study will just not take care of that, right? So we propose multiple hyperloop based comprehensive transportation studies over perhaps three to five year horizons, three times over the next 15 years, which basically can, you know, um, maximize all of the benefits that we've spoken about up until now but primarily give us a handle on how to really pull or push on these levers that are listed here. Yep, so all about that on the Hyperloop, all in all, this is what the paper was, and um, I hope we actually could explain what this project is and what this region is. Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Prashant. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a cynical question. This is India, right? That's right. And yeah, we have completely excluded the politics out of this. That's true. Uh, so we exclude, we talked a little bit about the land mafia, right? Yeah. So this is a privately funded, self-financed project, right? No subsidy from the government? So
So there are certain questions on the project I won't be able to answer, but yes, it's privately financed. The initial phase is privately financed. That's right. So things like uh, acquiring of land. Uh, Acquisition of the land traditionally as would take place in India would be obviously through the public sector itself. Right. So would these guys have to acquire land? But I see most of it is under the sea, right? Uh, no, actually. In fact, I can clarify that. Most of it is actually not under the sea because it's just right here in the creek. And though this is a central uh, chief minister's office of the government of Maharashtra, this is not China. So there are lots of checks and balances. And there are the That's cities true. and there are the states and there are the provinces and the districts, right? Yeah. How do you get them into brought into the system? Okay, so interesting. So those are definite questions that will come in a democratic structure, right? How would you sort of cooperate between different agencies? Now, while working for the government, obviously, I was also in charge of talking to all of these same bodies that you mentioned. There are as many as 18 or 19. But the idea is this starts on a smaller scale round, round about here. All right. Here. Okay. So we basically only start with this patch, as you can see. All right. And obviously, that's privately financed, which is what is public news. Um, and then, you know, after a number of years, maybe two or three years of having constructed that, gotten the approvals that are necessary, only then would this entire thing be sanctioned, so to say, right? I mean, the whole project is sanctioned in principle, but it would only start here. And the, the issues that you highlight from a democratic structure point of view only come up right, right here, which, which is also, you know, part of the commitment of the government of Maharashtra. I want to follow up on that. I mean, you're saying that the Hyperloop is going to replace all the road traffic and all the rail traffic, and you have representatives from the road and the rail on part, uh, you know, on board in this steering committee that you proposed. Yeah. Why? Why would they? Do so I like correct the first part of your question. Uh, Hyperloop will not replace rail or road. The Mumbai Pune Expressway has a capacity currently, right, which and, and it exhibits a certain number of people that go between the two cities, and that's a, that's a roughly around two hundred thousand. All right, two lakh per day. That capacity is the capacity of the Mumbai Pune Expressway and the rail line that operate currently. The growth rate of that line is also anticipated by current bodies, you know, such as the MSRTC, which runs, which runs the operations of the Mumbai Pune Expressway, or the rail line run by the Ministry of Railways. They have already planned expansions to the expressway. All right, and those expansion plans already factor that it would be completely full of your newer private vehicles uh, conducting that daily transfer. So effectively what we're trying to say is, these cities are gonna be interconnected more and more, right? As we with time. And Hyperloop is another such supplement that, that is aimed to capture that growth in demand for commutes between the two cities. Although it adds newer dimensions to what that commute looks like, which is, you know, over a very short period of time. So yeah. But if I'm in charge of the rail system, why would I want to even allow the hyperloop system? It's going to take away my most profitable passenger. No, it won't. So there were surveys that are conducted, which are obviously, you know, so there are surveys that take care of induced demand, then there are surveys that take care of diverted demand, right? Diverted demand from other modes of transport are completely different as compared to like, you know, developing a new rail line. Because, because those modes of transport function over a period of time. So let's say two hours, two and a half hours, right? The frequency and the time taken for this particular mode is completely different and therefore the fare structure will also be different, right? It's not going to take away from existing modes. It will only be for a newer class of commuters. Of course, it will also take away some of those commuters, but you know, the induced demand component <coughs> is much higher than uh, the diverted demand component. Yeah. So, Ministry, so you're trying to get a more elite class of professionals, say, investment bankers, relocate to Pune, but your urban geography argument would suggest that uh, people at those levels of income mm -hmm. value the sort of intangible big city benefits of culture and nightlife and so on that Bombay offers over Pune and will not move for a 30% cheaper cost of living. Okay, so uh, and, uh, now if you factor in the cost of hyperloop transportation, then make so it 25%. So it's not a homogeneous set of people. Um, it's not that there is a Mumbai investment banker who would consider this and then 
think that you know I don't want all the shit to put in. There would also be Pune investment bankers who may suddenly you know want to make that trip to Mumbai every day, or there may be other classes of professions or other classes of people in general who would want to locate to Pune uh, to make the trip to Mumbai because they can't simply afford uh, living in Mumbai in status quo. But also such arguments have limitations in the sense that we try to simplify them by tagging along what the commuter class would do, right? Uh, instead, the more scientific approach, and this is what you know, the government has done, various companies have done, of course, think tanks are starting to do right now, is to actually conduct uh, origin destination surveys, OD surveys as we call them, right? Um, where you fix fair structures, different structures, you know, X, 2X, 3X, and so on, you fix time frequencies. So if it costs you X, but it costs you 5T to reach uh, a particular destination, what would be the demand for you know, that kind of a service? So those origin demand surveys have already been uh, you know, conducted. And that's exactly what we talk about when, when I say a comprehensive transportation service, right? conducted by developmental authorities. Those numbers are the basis for the demand curve of such a line, as opposed to individually and qualitatively asking a class of professionals whether they would make you know, such a move. So yeah, I hope that answers.